of the right ones. Uh, and if we get some things wrong, then this side of the diagram tends to become rather weakened, and I think that's perhaps the situation that we find ourselves in now. So, just defining sedimentary science for today is part of geology, and it's the materials they're made of, the processes, what moves them, deposits, how they look when they see on the seabed or up the coast, and the history of those sedimentary systems through time. All of the above within a connected suite of sediments. So a simple sedimentary system might, might be one sand eroding at the end of a beach. You're familiar with longshore transport sand on the beach, off the coast of the north, and it accumulates at the other end. And for the amateurs amongst us, a good way of spotting a sand accumulation zone at the coast is um, golf, golf courses and military airports. You can test that for yourselves. Relevant to the Great Barrier Reef, we've got a whole range of natural sedimentary systems. I'll just illustrate a few very basic ones now. Obviously, river-driven sediment supply to the coast, Burke Delta, for example. Uh, wave or wind-driven alongshore transport, dominantly to the north on the GPR shelf. Tidally driven sediment accumulation mangrove systems, for instance, or you might be talking about gravity driven sediment transport down the continental slope. And, and many others, of course. One of the key questions about these pathways are which pathways are those which most influence habitats? And I think the answer is pretty much all of them. And then you come to the question well, how do these pathways work, including over what time scale? So, my kids enjoyed this, I hope it works for you. So I'm going to make an analogy of sediment transport pathways with a road system. Where the, the, the analogy I'm going to make is that this is Perth, and it's about 40 kilometres north of Perth to Joondala. So the roads are the same as the sediment transport pathways, and the vehicles are your sediment grains. Okay? I hope that works. Let's see. So a busy road is sediment present and it's moving. An empty road is a lag surface, so it's a surface like this, upon which there is effectively no sediment at all. A traffic jam is lots of sediment sitting on the seafloor but not moving. And of course that traffic changes over time. And for all sorts of reasons, sediment transport pathways change over time. And of course there are areas like parks and lakes and the river where there's no sediment accumulation effectively. Um, We've got no traffic, true. So, at peak hour, we might have active transport. So, up in Joondalup, school bus might dip around a little bit. And further down the coast, cars might go into Perth, they'll do their commuting, they'll do their daily work, and then they'll go home again. That's one nature of sediment transport, for example, based on one particular suite of drivers. On Sunday mornings, sediment grains, the cars, the vehicles might go in completely different directions. And in Perth, the general, massively common one is lots of convicts going up and down the coast finding the best place to go celebrate. Or all winning sharks. Um, on AFL day, like last Sunday, AFL was inside the cell, Mr. Australian already talking about AFL, uh, with Fremantle and uh, Perth at the uh, west coast, top of the top of the table. Last Sunday, Fremantle played Perth, and Subiaco was buried in vehicles. So that's a sediment accumulation zone. They can disperse, of course, in um, life with alcohol, half of them with joy and half of them with depression. The point about the habitats here is that the road network forms different habitats. The network is adapted to the variations in traffic at the particular point. Right? Um, and the parking conditions are adapted to the traffic. Too. So we have the sediment transport pathways, our car parks, etc., are adapted to the variations in sediment transport at that particular part of the pathway. The parks and reserves and lakes, they don't have cars. They're sediment free habitats. So the point is, as long as we trust our road planners, our road traffic network will match the amount of traffic transport that we expect. So the analogy I'm going to draw now is let's add some dredging material. So I'm going to add a multi-storey car park, a whole pile of sediment up at the Lumbee Beachside um, uh, suburb of Hillary's, and that sediment will slowly disperse at 
times into and out of the local community. The question here is, is that going to cause an impact to the whole road network? Well, the answer is clearly no. It's just going to be local and it's just going to be at times. And so a big part of the dredge material, if we put three times as much as that, just the three car parks in the middle of North Bridge, it's already congested, it's probably no measurable impact at all because the system there is already congested or already available to take that amount of seven. So the key here is without knowing the traffic network that you're dealing with, you couldn't possibly predict the consequences of having more cars on roads. That's the analogy that I want to make. Uh, so if we go to a set of tri, um, moving across a lag gravel surface. And as they move, they're forming different bed forms, different environments, different bed mobility regimes, different habitats. Different habitats both within the pathway and outside. And you can see the variation in habitats and make your own judgments on how similar or different they might be. The clear, clear thing there is you can't pronounce, if we were to dispose of an enormous amount of new material onto that seafloor, Without knowing anything about the nature of that pathway, you can't possibly pronounce on the consequences for your seabed habitats. Um, if you switch it off now, that's my message for the day, but I'll give you some other stuff too. We have to know what set of transport pathways we are affecting are, how they operate, what time scales, what habitats they support. Um, okay. Although, of course, many do pronounce on these things, so I move to my next section. Or common wisdom, common knowledge. There are countless articles in the press that influence the public, unfortunately, also policymakers, um, whether it be the printed press or whether it be the plethora of online media. Um, you might, for fun, take a note of the latest version of uh, Journal of Green Policy, where there's an, an analysis of um, the hard print media's representations of the app point. Um, uh, dredge disposal arguments. Um, it's worth a read, that's all I'll say. Um, so I'm going to pick one just as an example of how some dredging on the Great Barrier Reef issues were dealt with. This is the conversation which you, which you may be aware of. Um, when I grabbed this little bit block of text off the screen, there are about three articles that's about a month or so ago, of which about 25 to 30 are dredging related, and every single one, but one, is a negative message. It started, all part, in uh, 2013 when the other point thing became um, an issue. And there's an article by John Brody here at Jensen University. Dredging set to swamp decades of growth barrier protection. There's another one further up. Mounting evidence shows dredge oil threat to the Great Barrier Reef. I'm Terry Hughes, the Jensen U. There's more from John. There's one here. Reef madness. The other point decision makes no sense. Southampton. That was up to February 14. I've been showing you a few. There are more. After February 14, there was the exception when Russ Reichel from uh, says JCU here, but of course he's from Chief Chief Executive Officer of the Group, but put a reasonably cogent article together about why the myths about Great Barrier Reef dredging promulgated, I have to say, in many of those articles were perhaps less than um, correct. I didn't make any difference. He was pilloried in the press, on the TV, and in the conversation again, when we had more um, uh, conversation articles telling us about how terrible it all was. There are some common themes to the articles on the right, the three main ones. One, they tend to confuse association with causation to, a, to an article. Secondly, most of the authors operating outside their field of technical expertise. There's not a power carrying set. Challenge me if you think I'm wrong. Thirdly, none of them, none, examine any primary sedimentary evidence. So, in my view, academic rigor, well, it's written by academics, it's not very rigorous in terms of the necessary sedimentology, it's certainly journalism and maybe there's a little too much flair. And if there was any old, oh, there are some old people in the audience because I'm one, I like if Elvis was in the room and started singing, he'd sing this song. And those of you who are having to 
themselves. Good, but any of you aren't. Sorry, I couldn't find I don't think just to be <laughs> Anyhow, many of those articles draw heavily on some key reports, right? So if we go through from 2013, we've got the state of water quality on the GPR, the 2014 adequate report, 2015, so those government ones effectively, we've got Lobby Group, Earth Justice, producing new report 2015, we've got Queensland Audit Office, producing another one. And on the, on the right, we've got the synthesis of current knowledge on biophysical impacts of dredging and disposal of Great Barrier Reef written in late 2014 and updated in 2015. There are some common factors about these too, uh, I won't point out. <coughs> the sedimentary geoscience input, input into them is cursory, weak, or entirely absent, and yet they are dealing with a sedimentary subject. It's bizarre. They repeat and reuse, basically, similar information, and they treat it uncritically. Worst, I think there's too little acknowledgement of the range of evidence out there, not opinion, evidence. And there's too little consideration of alternative explanations for the evidence that is there. There's very little critical thinking and absolutely zero fuel testing. And of course they do the usual association and causation mix up. So we have to ask ourselves, why is this so? Why in 2015 we are so divorced from the main science that we need if we're looking at dredging on the continental shelf of importance. It's certainly not a lack of funding. Um, Queensland government is putting in 100 million over five years, federal government 140 million for the Reef Trust, although it uh, tells us, of course, there's 485 million in reef investments this year. That's how you count it, there's no lack of funding. There's not actually a lack of relative you know, of geoscience either. Our national geoscience institution, the Geological um, uh, Geoscience Australia has produced a, a, a few major reports. Top left there is the one that defines and describes in pretty good detail most of the continental shelf around Australia. There's even a special one on the Great Barrier Reef margin. Up at top right, we've got a, a terrific report on seabed diversity di devoted to the Great Barrier Reef shelf. And on the bottom is the report that this draws on this report, uh, this talk draws on, and Peter and I. So that I'll try and show you um, within the talk the breadth, some of the breadth of evidence that, that I think is relevant and that's being uh, ignored. I'm not taking that that's it's not so good to get. But there is clearly something wrong when government reports like this one, which is a Queensland government report, part of a brief plan, presents us with a table defining priority pollutants. Is something that makes the place or substance no longer suitable for use. It tells us that the different areas of the Great Barrier Reef shaft have a risk with respect to nitrogen. It's very high for the wet tropics in the Burdekin, a bit lower for Mackay with Sunday Legion. For pesticides, uh, it's considered to have high risk with Burdekin and Mackay with Sunday. And when I have blanked out, it's said, it's said it's apparently a pollutant. And it's most dangerous in the Burdekin and the Fitzroy. These are the largest two river deltas on the east coast of Australia. So that is, we've somehow got to the point where a river delta is de facto a bad thing for a continental shelf. Um, another example, and there are many within this report, um, it, analysis of the latest evidence leads us to conclude that suspended sediments, nutrients, pesticides, but suspended sediments are included in the Great Barrier Reef and concentrations are likely to cause environmental. In sedimentary terms, it's just, it's indefensible. It, it simply doesn't cut the mustard. And when um, the outlook report, the Great Barrier Reef 2014 outlook report, is underpinned by a technical report, which I look at enthusiastically only to find that all the details are unavailable, even though it's been used to form government policy already and spending. And it recognises only one type of nearshore of coastal coral reef. So at best, the technical information that's being used is oversimplistic. At, at worst, it's downright misleading. And such reports completely ignore the wealth of established relevant geoscience. So, big question, you know, why? Why the long lasting? Because this has been going on for 20, 30 
give those. Why is this fundamental disconnect there? Well, to some extent, I think different perspectives are inevitable. The time scales of politicians break too are generally the electoral one, a few years. Most regulators and ecologists, perhaps a decade, perhaps two. So on this time scale, perhaps those people would be looking at that sort of up to about 20 years, I think I've given them more than years. But I have to say that if you're a paleontologist or a geologist or an evolutionary biologist, you think about things that lead up to much longer time scales, for many thousands of years. The viewpoint is one fundamentally of habitats and systems. In fact, the very basis of geology, how it started in the world, is one looking at variations of habitats through time as recorded in the, the sedimentary record. So that the time scales that those people would look at would be up to here, in fact way beyond, but I've stopped it here because of about 9,000 years or so, that's the oldest component of the policy in Great Barrier Reef. So we have a fundamental disconnect in, in training and viewpoint. And we probably need to recognise that because, as the old saying goes, we can only see what we can stand. Now I'm not the first person to talk about this. Mike Risk, an impoverished geomorphologist, geologist from the Marcy University in Canada, came across to spend a few years at Ames in the late 80s and 90s. And when he left, one of his contributions was to leave an article in Reef Encounter, which said, a monitoring programme that does not include sedimentologists chemists and oceanographers, as well as biologists, is in danger of being useless. And without an integrated approach, biological monitoring is a sterile exercise, incapable of identifying causes. Um, and in the latest book by Dave Hopley, Scott and Kevin Parnell, when they're describing regional sediment accumulation and turbidity, they rightly say that such phenomena are beyond the normal temporal scale of ecology. And failure to acknowledge that it's beyond that temporal scale of ecology means that it's likely to lead to the overestimation of anthropogenic impacts. And I think that's another, another reason why we are where we are. So, some of the key sedimentary geoscience. I'm going to use this map here, where all these places are. Um, it was useful in Perth, but it's not useful here. I'll come back to that map a few times. First of all, I'm going to describe these things called turbid sediment reefs, that I prefer to call ephemeral, detrital, coral communities. Also now, be more dates, lots of descriptions of past communities, and a sound understanding of all the sedimentary processes. Um, and I should acknowledge that this is not necessarily very new, but there's been a, a huge increase in information since probably the, the late 90s, but there's plenty of older information that describe these systems uh, without necessarily process understanding the detail that we can do now, but this is not new. And indeed, in fact, there was a special issue of coral reefs in 2003, precisely describing these sorts of things and, and, and how we might look at coral reef environments rather than what we can do. So this is an image of Middle Reef in Townsville from Chris Perry and Al's paper in 2009 with a, um, the, um, the reef ball, ballpark 900 metres long, a few hundred metres wide, and that's the symmetry, plenty of cores through it. I've just chosen um, this plot from the paper, which shows depth below surface against age. So this is deep and old over here. Each one of these lines represents the growth curve as derived from one of the cores taken on the reef. Okay. And so you can see that some of the cores started quite early, a few started around 800 years ago, many started and accumulated very quickly in the last few hundred years. And the types of sediments that you tend to see in these mid core sections are these they're mud dominated uh, with. Uh, that, so there's a mud dominated sedimentary matrix with plenty of in-situ coral framework material. And the upper ones, they tend to get a bit more sandy. You can go and look up the details if you wish. The one liner from that is this ballpark, 1,500 years of growth on and off in that environment. It's been a muddy environment for, for the 
the whole time. Most of the, most of the growth has occurred in the last 700 years. It's an ephemeral because it hasn't always been there, to tribal because most of it's broken. Coral community, it's not a framework of coral reef. Another example, when Michelle was in Halifax Bay, first the scholar that I published, and since then there's been lots of, lots of papers, far more than that one. In uh, on shoals. It has two basic shoals, south and the north one. This one tells you all the cores that have been taken there and analysed. And the, the, the signal is broadly the same. Um, in the, in the um, 1300, 1500, 1600 years ago, these are timelines, flash lines, connecting different parts of the, of the cores across the reef. That's the um, southern reef and the northern reef here without boring you with the detail, although that's a nice colour photograph, and that's a, that's a piece of coral, a uh, piece of coral sitting in clay-like mud, beautiful like pottery clay mud, and I pick, picked it out, washed it, put it back in place so you can see that it's there, um, and the dates on all that material show us that this reef has been growing for 13, 1600 years or so, in that environment, in episodic fashion, it's ephemeral to try to community. And there's another one, there's like a shoals, blah 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 blah. The like shoals is this nice one because it really emphasizes the discontinuity here. Here's one age and just above it, 50 centimeters or so there's another age. Okay. They are discontinuous features, they are not always there. And there are many, many, many other examples, all published in the international referee geological journals. Lots of this is not in but it's not accepted and it's not incorporated. And the second thing is um, sedimentary changes on the Great Barrier Shelf um, driven by cyclones, the action of cyclones. Again, many, many cores, many dates, great understanding of sedimentary products and good understanding of water processes too. And that's sort of a summary diagram that I put together with Bob Carter in the early 2000s, illustrating in general terms the movement of sediment on the Great Barrier Shelf under cyclones. It's embarrassing, I think, that probably the world's best study on um, sedimentation driven by cyclones in the world happened on the Great Barrier in 1986 as part of Mike Gaming's PhD, and yet it doesn't completely underpin how the Great Barrier shelf is managed. It's a world it was a world leading piece of work back then and it remains so now. This was a study of a, a piece of seafloor about 50 kilometres by 30 kilometres big. It's a colour image that I'm going to blow up for you and explain briefly. The white on the left is land. Here's the coastline. It's meridian in this vein. This green colour, taken straight from my thesis, is the 10 metre bathymetric platform. The slope in yellow leading down to the middle shelf here. And then we come, come up against the <laughs> um, we come up against the inner part of the middle shelf reefs. Um, so the key feature to notice on these records, are, so these are the survey lines that took using um, size and sonar and sub-bottom profiling to look at the, what's underneath the seabed. Are those little lines that are going along the continental shelf? These are both sand ribbons and longitudinal furrows. I'll tell you what they represent in a moment. And they're a recognisable mixture of old sedimentary structures superposed by new ones. This is a um, horrible geological work on Palimpsest. It's, uh, it's an old landscape with lots of mobile sediment moving above it. Virtually the entire middle shelf, the orange section, contains shelf parallel bed forms, many kilometres long. They're mostly sand ribbons, which are positive features, a couple of decimetres high, perhaps 10 or 20 metres wide kilometers in length, and they represent features driven by flow that's going parallel. Um, when there are fewer sediments and the currents are a bit stronger, you actually begin to incise the seabed and you see longitudinal burrows. So, what we can see from this is um, that the whole um, seabed is at least uh, is at subject to current speeds on well at 1.3 meters per second at, at, at times. 
Now, what does it do to the sediments? Well, this is the sediment um, just before cyclone when it hit. So this sediment is probably a few decades or so old. It's mixed, it's biotabating, it's muddy, shelly sand. Four days after the cyclone, we've got at least a decimetre of well sorted, unmixed carbonate sand. So the vast majority of that shelf has been moved to a depth of a decimetre or so and transported up to the north or west. So I'm trying to convey the huge physical extent of seabed mobility under this cycle. It's incredible. What does it do to habitats? Is the question I'd like to think about. So there's, so there's quite deep reworking, but in the long term, there's actually relatively little sediment accumulation. Um, ignoring the top, top two um, seismic sections here. The middle three describe in cross section, so in vertical profile, what these features look like. So this one down the bottom, this one down there, this, this one E describes the continuous post cyclone, um, post glacial sediment veneer, mixed up in the sand, where that accumulates at about 200 microns a year, it's about a sand grain. Um, this is what those sand ones look like in cross section. You can see that they're these wide, shallow features with gutters between, and where there's less sediment, those gutters become erosive, and those are the sand uh, longitudinal furrows. So, over many centuries, the middle shelf seafloor accumulates vertically only between about a clay grain and a sand grain per year. But that's as long periods of stasis and brief. Episodes of what we tell. All indicators on the Great Barrier Reef show this. I'm going to show you some more evidence of the Eastern Townsville, then we're in the shoal on the outer part of the mid shelf, where there are ribbons and furrows tens of kilometres long, massive structures that show these seabed features. This is that image blown up and aligned. So you can see that all the striations from the top. Top left to bottom right, they're all those sand ribbons and longitudinal furrows. Um, all of them orientated along the shelf. And one of the more beautiful features in the world, I think, is this coral reef or in the shoal, with a scour up in front of it and a tail of sediment behind it, extending 10 kilometers or more. I should say that that's 35 kilometers from there to there, that image. Um, uh, the, the really beautiful part is this part, I think, just here downstream of that, of that reef where you can see the longitudinal furrows diverge around the shore. So during the cyclones, you can see the sedimentary products caused by the flow going around that coral reef. So all in, and there are many more indicators in this image and on other images that show this. We know how long it's been going on for because equivalents have been studied by Peter House and, Coral, uh, and um, Andrew Heap from Geoscience Australia in the Gulf of Carpentaria, where they actually taken seismic and caused through those sediment tails and found out how long uh, they have been, 5,000 years or so. So, the next thing I want to point out is that cyclones occur in clusters, and I'd like to consider what this means for habitats too. These are basically the tropical cyclones around northern Australia from the to 2009, whereby the one, the one and a half tropical cyclones per year on the Queensland shelf drive that bed sediment to the northwest. There's slightly more on the northwest shelf, and they're slightly stronger, and they tend to drive an equivalent sand transport down to the southwest. The evidence is broad and established. There are many local effects, but that's the broad picture. The numbers of tropical cyclones importantly vary with time. Just the red, the red measurements here represent how many tropical cyclones per year there have been on this one's the northwest shelf since 1971 and 2000. And you can see that they occur in packets, gap in between. So there is a decadal variation in the number and indeed the severity of those tropical cyclones. Um, the yellow is just the global climate models that we can have comfort in, and maybe they, they show broadly the same thing. 
fact, there is physical evidence from the mid-shelf, quite new physical evidence on the mid-shelf of past cyclones on the Great Barrier Reef Shelf and their effects. Um, by uh, some work being done down at UQ, published recently, where they looked at the coral rubble blocks thrown up from the front of the reef flat onto the top of the reef. And then what they've done is dated the coral rubble blocks, like these, on the surface of the reef flat. They've been thrown out of place by large waves. And they, they date the material in those blocks and they can give us the first indicator, roughly, of when those blocks were dislodged from the reef, um, the four reef slope, or the edge of the reef flat. First indicators, there's some plenty of uncertainties there, but what they can also do is they can emphasise the fact that periods of high cyclonic activity occur over the last thousand years. And what they did, and people like wiggle matching these sorts of um, these sorts of occasions where they've got a time series. So and what they did was they, they compared it to the Pacific Decade Oscillation, which is a um, climatic uh, characteristic of the Pacific, like Enso, but not quite, over the last thousand years or so, and plotted the age of the material in their reef flats, and they observed that there was some sort of an association between positive PDO and the occurrence of the rubble blocks on the reef flats that they think is relevant, it's certainly interesting. And in the last 100 years where we've got much better records of the, doc of the documented cyclones, the upper graph here, that's where the data coral blocks fit. So the, so the contention here is that the, the packets of cyclones or cyclones uh, uh, every couple of decades or so tend to be the ones that do the, do the damage to the reflux. So the key message is high intensity cyclones tend to have groups over a period of five or ten years, and they tend to be separated by one or several decades. And what's so what for dredging and regulation? This is a bit about dredging, right? So, how does this all relate to set of transport pathways? Um, I'm just going to recap very briefly cyclones, repeated effects on the coastline, I haven't described much, the seafloor, various types of reefs, thereby I would contend its habitats. We know the GBR is about 9,000 years old present incarnation, and we know from historical data this all part four and four and a bit, tropical cyclones affect Queensland every year. So the GBR has had about 30,000 cyclones-ish in, in its life, in its policy. That's actually the same number of days, quite by chance, that you will live if you live to 80. Right? So it's a lot. Cyclones are neither extreme or disastrous from the GPR system. It wouldn't be there if they were. They are simply one of the many standard components of the GBR environment, and they constantly act with all those other components to shape the Great Barrier Reef Shelf's evolution and the reefs on it and the other habitats on it. So we could ask, well, to what extent might human actions be able to significantly alter the sedimentary regime? And um, without going into detail, we're just going to go to an obvious one in a moment, but we, we take a step back over the last few decades there have been repeated conversations in the regulatory community around the world uh, and government advisors on where the best place to put dredge sediment is on the continental shelf. Whether those disposal sites should be retentive and retain all that sediment in one place or whether they should be dispersive and disperse out, which is better. They come to the conclusion, I think it's no surprise, that no one size fits all answer exists and that site specific factors dominate. Well, I think that's, that has to be true. It has to be true. Why? Because I think from a sedimentary perspective, the question it should be more sophisticated and sedimentary ought to be sensible. And this is the appropriate question. What effect is the addition of sediment likely to have? back to our cars, what effect is the addition of more cars put on the road at that point in time going to have on the traffic network that we're interested in and the habitats that it represents? 
And remember that our habitats are complex and they are mobile. So that in order to answer those questions, we need to do a few things. We need to measure on the seabed a certain type, where it is and where it isn't, how mobile it is, how frequently it's, mo um, it's mobile, and what nature of mobility that takes. Its thickness, its form, its form is a crucial one. The different bed forms that you get on the sea floor are incredibly important microhabitats for all sorts of things. And they control the microhabitats. They control the benthic fauna and all the lot. Papers on that, if you like. And of course, then we need to overlay that information with the biology, the chemistry, and everything else that helps understand how that habitat works. Such pathways need defining on the Great Barrier Reef shelf, without which there can be no defensible judgment on the local effects of sediment placement on the Great Reef shelf. You can't do it. The characteristics of the regional. The red arrows on here, the regional middle shelf Great Barrier Reef transport pathway driven by cyclones. The characteristics of this pathway, the red arrows, are it's driven by cyclones. Its location is broadly on the middle shelf, things spread out to the outer shelf and the inner. It operates on time scales of decades to millennia. Its length is certainly hundreds of kilometres, it's so 500, for sake of argument. Its width is certainly greater than 30 kilometres. It's got a mean thickness of active layer of perhaps one, perhaps two decimeters. It's got an active volume of something like 1,500 million <coughs> cubic meters. So, is there is there a realistic way in which we are able to influence that sediment transport pathway? The answer is no, no, and hell no. So, because the past and present nature of sediment transport pathways are the key controls on the nature of the habitats and importantly on the likelihood of natural change in that habitat at that location over time, then it is simply inconceivable that there will not be repeated the major changes in most, I've put really many, I think most, if I struggle to think of one, it isn't, but many parts of the physical Great Barrier Reef shelf system through time. That is one sentence, most parts of the GBR are naturally ephemeral. We have to get used to it. So let's, let's look at the timing and how, on what time scales does habitat resetting occur? The geological knowledge that we have tells us. Um, the numbers on this map represent average recurrence intervals between major sedimentary events associated with cyclones as derived from the geological record. And the little pluses and minuses or plus minuses represent the general trend of whether an environment accumulates sediment, does a bit of both, or is generally erosive. So for, for beach ridges, for instance, such as these at, at Cowley Beach, you, the, the numbers are there on, on average, the beach ridges up and down the Great Barrier Reef shelf, it's a ballpark average recurrence interval of something Shelly is it's much the same. Shelly ridges, they, they look like that, they occur in muddy environments. For the inner shelf seabed, it's much shorter, partly because the inner shelf tends to be accreted faster than the outer record. 120 to 150 years. As we go further offshore, and we get into the mid shelf, where the sediments are accumulating almost not at all, remember that clay to sand grain per year, over the last few thousand years, the record is unsurprisingly far less complete, and the numbers we get out of the geological records turn out to be 360 to 600 years. I emphasise here, those are the maximum, maximum times at which those habitats are completely reset. It's probably something like a third or fifth of that. And in some places it will be much more, much far, much more frequent. So which takes us into human time scales, and I hope, and I do but most of all, these are habitat timescales. These are natural cycles over which the habitat is gone and it regenerates. So knowledge is pretty much opaque to both regulators and habitat-focused sites. I'm not repeating up the Roland picture of Peter Dirty because I've talked to them about it, but the big report on seabed diversity that 
define so beautifully many of the different seabed habitats of the Great Barrier Reef shelf. When you poke them and say, look, how old do you think that habitat is? They don't know. And I think it's a massively important question. To just emphasize, most GBR habitats are ephemeral. We talk about reef flats to try to grow communities, but to have benthic systems, but it's the same in mangroves, whether you're on an open coastline or whether you're on in estuarine systems. It's the same for seagrass beds, whether you're in the sandier, mobile seagrass beds, or the muddier seagrass beds and shallow muddy plains. And it's pretty much the same for the inner to middle shelf transitions. It's the feather edge of where the tree is set. Oh, Guideline documents. Now, regulation. The, the main regulatory document that the federal government has from 2009, it has almost no marine geoscience in it. And yet, that's the key document that defines what goes on on the continental shelf as defined by the federal government. Now, in the States, it's a little better. The West Australian has, government has a series of guidelines which are held up to be best practice. None of those, whether they're relating to recommending environmental conditions, marine dredging proposals, environmental principles, factors and objectives, or protecting the quality of West Australia's marine environment. None of them have any of these concepts in marine geological habitat resetting long time periods. On the GBR, there's similar documents too, but I'll draw your attention to some more influential ones. The consensus statement on water quality, the Adler report, and the, um, the report on dredging that came out this year. They don't have that information in, they don't have that as a basis. So it seems to me that the quality of advice that the government gets and the nature of the outcomes are inevitably risky. They risk being badly compromised. And I think age matters. Um, audience participation section, if you like. How old are these habitats? Are they hours to days? Days to weeks? Weeks to years, decades to centuries. I'm not expecting it, that's fine. What about these habitats? How many do you have in the middle of that? The Gorgonian garden? Or the Briarzone rubble up here? How old are they? It's really important that you know. It's also important that we know how rare they are as well. Rarity and age really affect our approach to management. We will take a completely different view on land, I'm looking at the habitat of the Wallamai pine and how old it is, hundreds of years, perhaps even thousands. We take a different view about managing that in environmental terms than we would the scrub, the eucalyptus scrub behind the beach of the And probably your lawn too. If your lawn's on towns of Wagon Rain for age, your lawn's at the moment it's brown and it's dry. Hopefully, they're probably not too worried about it because you know it's rains next. It'll come back, it might not come back brilliantly this year, maybe it'll come back better in the wet season. Okay. System understanding really helps too. I remember when I arrived in Townsend in the late 80s, there was a big argument in the public domain about whether fire was good for the Australian bush. I think we've moved on from that now, where fire is a deliberate management tool. And, and it's understood as a part of maintaining generating much of the Australian forest. So to conclude, cyclones reset most of the habitats on the Great Barrier Reef every few decades. They do. We should manage accordingly. It's an overriding control on habitats and probably their long-term resilience. Field-based research is essential. We don't recognise and define event sediment transport pathways with regard to dredge disposal we have no basis upon which to say whether it's good or it's bad in purely sub-sedimentary terms. So without that, we can't manage to develop appropriate regimes of management and monitoring. We're at risk of wasting an awful lot of money by managing noise rather than recognising the signal. Management of dredging clearly needs to be site specific and needs to be based on an understanding of these set of transport pathways. We have to define them, therefore, we understand what potential changes there might be to the habitats. Frankly, I can't think of a single reason why placing dredge sediment onto the middle shelf into that set of transport path in the middle shelf could have any negative 
impact in the long term to any habitat on the right part of the shelf. There's no physical reason why that should be the case. It comes from that that um, comparing, there's lots of work going on trying to compare the volumes of river input with the volumes of dredge sediment input to the entire right part of the shelf. It is completely meaningless. It's a fantastically interesting exercise, I'm sure. But in practical terms, sedimentary terms, it's meaningless. Mostly because it doesn't consider the sediment transport part that is involved. And, it, and as we know with our road network, it makes a difference where you put that extra traffic. You don't want to put 10 tons of uh, 10,000 new trucks in the middle of your kids' playground. You don't want to put loads of kids on scooters up the middle of a motorway. So you've got to understand the network transport part. Most from the bottom of my heart, I had this is the easily the most important one. This, this multi decade failure to use sedimentary geoscience has been incredibly wasteful time and money. It's led to distressing science, an incredible lack of critical thinking. It's damaged the credibility, I think, of marine science on the East Coast because of the the use of hyperbole and advocacy over objective science. And it's got to be rectified. Um, this is just something that brings out the office. 40 years worth of um, government funded projects, not a single one that looks at the history or the physical processes of the shelf and the meant to be managing. I think it's a disgrace. Um, lastly, and because it comes up so often and it's on so many web pages, the famous Stone Island inshore coral reefs, which appeared in the Outlook Report 2014, where we are led to believe that the photo was taken 120, 30 odd years ago, 100 years ago, represent how it should be, and the more recent photographs represent something that we have done. All that core information, all that sedimentary information that I've described to you show that. I'll go, go to that in a moment, but you know, I forgot because in the outlet report it's accompanied by this quote. Historical photographs of inshore coral reefs have been especially powerful in illustrating changes over time. They certainly have. Photos are powerful things. The changes in the fringing reefs of Stone Island are typical of many inshore reefs. They certainly are. They largely took place before monitoring programs began. They certainly did. Thousands and thousands of years ago, as work will show in the Future. But the vast array of core evidence already shows now. So when we get to the last sentence, modern assessments of the condition are likely to be based on already shown to be based It's just wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. The core evidence shows us in this photo has helped emphasize the Great Barrier shows of natural variability. But it looks like that. In that photo, there's nothing to do with climate. Without, without humans, reefs have always changed. So maybe we need to reconsider our view of impacts. And personally, I'd like us to be using nascent or senescent or ephemeral far more than the horribly loaded and inaccurate degraded. So, final slide. Have we unwittingly missed the geoscience of oh, Black Hole? Yes, we have. We missed sedimentary geoscience. We probably missed a lot of evolution of biology too. Lots of science being used. Often people say science is in. Here it's just in. 